grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Well, welcome to St Peter's Church here in West Blatchington in Hove, uh, to our online and telephone service. It's great that you can join us today, whether this is your first time joining us online or on the telephone, or whether you've been joining us for a long time. It's great that you can gather. And it's a special Sunday today. It's what the Church of England calls Bible Sunday. And it gives us an opportunity to, to think more about this thing that Christians call the Bible, that we believe is how God speaks to us. It is the Word of God. And we're going to be thinking about that more later on in our service. We're going to start our time together by saying this opening prayer. So if you're able to at home, please join in. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, because today is Bible Sunday, we're going to be doing some craft online and in the service that helps us to understand how God's word, the Bible, is powerful. And one of the ways the Bible talks about itself is like this. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any sword. You see, nothing can get in the way of stopping God's powerful word. So you can download this in the description just below and print it off, maybe put it on some card, or you can draw your own to make a sword and to use it as a bookmark so that when you're reading through the Bible, you can save the place where you're reading and you can remember that it's not just any book you're reading, but you're reading the Word of God. And we've also got this word search as well, which is in the shape of a sword, and you can see how many of the books of the Bible you can find hidden in that. Again, the link is in the description just below the video. Have fun doing that. And now we're going to sing a song. And we've sung this once or twice before at St Peter's, and it's called A Light and a Hammer. And it helps us to understand how God's word is powerful. So I hope you enjoy singing along at home.
It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of the Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of the Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it to make us whole So let us confess our sins together to Almighty God, confident of the forgiveness we have through Jesus Christ. We say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Nehemiah. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women, and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shemar, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshalam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, and to send portions, and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let their truth prevail. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises, and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built, and the earth is filled with your glory. A reading from the Gospel according to St Matthew. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. A police inspector went in to visit his local primary school, where he was asked to lead a lesson on the Bible. He began by asking, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? There was a long silence as the children shuffled nervously in their seats. Eventually, a little lad put up his hand and said, please, sir, my name is Bruce Jones. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't me. The policeman thought that the reply was very cheeky, so he reported it to the headmaster. After a pause, the headmaster replied, I know Bruce Jones. He's an honest chap. If he said he didn't do it, then he didn't. The inspector was exasperated. The headmaster was either very rude or very ignorant. So the inspector wrote to the Department of Education to complain and received this response. 
Dear Sir, we are sorry to hear about the walls of Jericho and that nobody has admitted causing the damage. If you send us an estimate, we will see what we can do about the cost. Now, it's a silly story, isn't it? But I think it makes a good point. We live in a time where the majority of people don't know what is in this book, the Bible. And the thing is, that's not just a problem outside the church, but increasingly it's a problem within it as well. Many people today won't grow up, possibly knowing the stories of Jesus' life, of Adam and Eve, of Daniel in the lion's den. And with that, we risk missing out on something truly great. Mahatma Gandhi, who wasn't even a Christian, noticed this. He said, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, to turn the world upside down and to bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it's nothing more than a piece of literature. Now this Sunday, today in the Church of England, we call it Bible Sunday. But of course we believe as Christians that every Sunday is Bible Sunday. But today we've actually got an opportunity to do things slightly differently and to think about this book. Now normally at St Peter's our sermons are called expository sermons. The word basically means that we we look at one or a few passages of text from the Bible and we go through it to understand what it means and through that what God is communicating to us. So it's my hope and my prayer that we would all leave this service at the end with a new or renewed passion for the Bible. So let's ask, what is it, why do we read it, and how does it affect us? Firstly then, what is it? So while the Bible we hold in our hands looks like one book, in fact it's made out of 66, covering the Old Testament, which takes us up to just before the birth of Jesus Christ, and then into the New Testament, which covers his life and the early church. And within it, there's about 40 different authors who have contributed to those individual books. It was collated together over a period of about 2,000 years, so it didn't just drop onto someone's lap one day. But while there are different authors responsible for different parts of the Bible, ultimately we believe there is only one true author, and that is God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, the Apostle Paul writes that all scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Basically what he's saying is that God has breathed his word through human authors so that he tells us what he wants us to know. The Bible, for example, is different to the Quran, the Muslim's holy book. Muslims believe that the Quran miraculously came from God, that it was presented perfect into Muhammad's hands. But that's not what Christians believe about the Bible. We believe that God has brought the Bible into existence through human agents. Yes, it is his word. Yes, it contains the things he wants us to read. It's not an accident. It's not just the collective thoughts of what some people have believed at different points. It's just like we say each and every Sunday here at St. Peter's, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So it was authored by normal people like you and me, but as they were carried along by God's spirit. He's the true author. So in one sense, it's a human book, but it's also divine. It's also really important to note that the Bible contains different genres of writing. You know genres, different things like poetry, like we find in the Psalms, or prophecy, like Isaiah and Jeremiah, or letters, like the letters of Paul and John and Peter, or the Gospels, eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And actually having some basic grasp of those different genres is really important for us as we read it. Because we read genres in different ways, don't we? I mean, you don't read a birthday card in the same way that you read an instruction leaflet that comes with your TV. And with these different genres, we also discover that it's really important to read the Bible in what we call context. That basically means that we don't just read a verse on its own. That's not how the Bible works, with the possible exception of of Proverbs. When we read a verse or a passage in the Bible, we look to see what's come before it and what happens after it. Because otherwise we can end up twisting it to suit what we want it to mean and take something out of context. There's an old saying that helps us to remember how important this is. If you take the text out of the context, what are you left with? A con. It's a bit cheesy, but I think it gets the point across. 
When we read scripture, we must understand where it comes. Because sometimes the Bible might be telling us something to do, or it might be recording something that it doesn't approve of. But what about its subject? Well, just like we believe there is ultimately one author to scripture, the more we read the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, the more we see how they tie together. We see that there is one big subject, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, we've got a a Bible reading group here at St. Peter's, we have started up again, and we've been going through the book of uh, Mark's Gospel. And in that, we've been seeing how when Jesus' ministry begins, it starts with him fulfilling scripture from the Old Testament, things written about him hundreds of years before they came true. You see, this one author God has one subject in mind, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the salvation that he brings. In fact, that is the purpose of the Bible, to show us how we can be part of God's kingdom through salvation in Jesus Christ. Yes, of course, it contains other things as well about how we should live, how we should spend our money and the things we shouldn't do. But its primary purpose is to show us our need for a saviour and how God has lovingly provided for us through his son, Jesus Christ. This is why this book is so precious. As the Church of England says, it contains everything necessary for salvation. We don't have to look anywhere else. If you want to know how we can be saved, how we can enter eternal life, we only need to look in this book. It's God's gift to us so that we might know him and be saved. And as we heard in our gospel reading, the words we have are eternally significant, aren't they? Look at that last verse, verse 35. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus' words are more permanent than any man-made material than anything here on earth. They last forever because he lasts forever. And the Bible is his word. So secondly, then, why do we read it? Well, one previous vicar in Cambridge describes the action of the Bible like this. The Bible is the word of God that does the work of God through the spirit of God in the people of God. So one of the reasons that Christians read the Bible is because God actually does work in us as we read it. You see, to read the Bible is actually a supernatural encounter. It's almost as if we are reading, as we're reading the Bible, God through it is reading us. As we read the pages of scripture, God is shining a light onto our hearts and our lives, showing us where we're going wrong and showing us the way forward, helping us to grow to become more like Jesus. And God, the Holy Trinity, is involved. It's the Father's plan, working through Jesus Christ, the Word of God, in the power of the Spirit to bring about change in the people of God, the church. I don't know about you, but when I hear the Bible being talked about like that, it it makes me excited. It makes me think that, actually, I don't read my Bible enough. It certainly makes me think that I don't normally read my Bible with that kind of attitude, that kind of thought. That as we gather to hear the Bible on a Sunday each week, or as we read it in a group, or as we sit down to read it early in the morning, or or last thing at night, that at that moment God is doing his work in me, in you. It's exciting, isn't it? Even though we're so small and God is so big, he wants to be at work in us. And the way that he's chosen to do that is through his word. That's why we should want to read it. You see, when we read the Bible individually or as a group or as a church, we encounter God's personality. We learn what he's like, not just what people have thought about him, but actually how he has shown himself to be. We read about the fact that he is a father to the fatherless, that he is a husband to the widow, a parent to the orphan. And we encounter his plan to save a sinful humanity for himself, to bring them to be what he wants them to be. We meet him in the text. I wonder if you've ever had a pen pal. I don't think they're quite as common anymore as they used to be because we can email and WhatsApp and that kind of stuff. But the idea is with a pen pal is that you would send letters back and forth over the months and years to someone else, maybe to someone on the other side of the world. And if you were really fortunate, you might get to meet that person one day. But if you do, you're not meeting a total stranger, are you? You've been talking for years. You know what things they like. You know what things they hate. You you know about the experiences they've had. Perhaps they've confided in you secrets that they've never told anyone else. Although you've not met them in the flesh, you know them. 
And it's like that with the Bible. In fact, it's even greater because God, by his spirit, is with us when we read it. God is here with us as we read his word. He opens up our minds and our hearts and helps us to see what he is like. It's a wonderful, supernatural encounter with the living God, the creator of the whole universe, who through his word shows us what he's like. So we've seen what the Bible is, haven't we? It's God's word to us showing Jesus the Messiah. We see why we need to read it, because in it we encounter the living God who shows us what he's like and changes us. Then lastly then, how does it affect us? Well, the first thing to say is that the Bible shapes what the church has always done and in fact what we do today. It's not an accident that we do certain things in the life of the church. It's because the Bible tells us to do those things. For example, baptism. We baptise people in the church because the Bible tells us to. In Matthew 28, Jesus commands his disciples to go and baptise in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So through the Bible, Jesus commands us to baptise, and that's what we do. What about Holy Communion or the Eucharist? Well, again, the Bible tells us to do this. During the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus said, do this as often as you eat and drink this in remembrance of me. It's a command in the Bible which the church is obedient to. What about something like prayer? Again, the Bible tells us to pray. It also tells us how to pray. It says we must pray for our enemies and for those who persecute us. Not just to pray for the people that we like and we find it easy to pray for. What about caring for others? Well, the Bible tells us to care for the orphan and the widow, to look after those who are vulnerable, who are the weakest in society. The Bible also tells us that we should be involved with evangelism in sharing the good news of life in Jesus through the way that we live and the things that we say and then being ready as we see in 1 Peter 3.15, to always be ready to give an account for the hope that is in us. So we try and make ourselves ready by being able to share something of our own faith story of how we've come to this place in our lives and where our true hope is. And for me personally, as your rector, this has a huge impact on what I do and why I do it. When I was ordained priest, the charge given to me by the bishop was that I was to unfold the scriptures to preach the word in season and out of season, and to declare the mighty acts of God. I have made a public promise that I will faithfully teach the Bible to you. And please pray that I will not go back on my word. Now you may be aware that that we use something here, Sunday by Sunday, called the lectionary. Basically it's, it's a plan of Bible readings that lots of churches use. And it repeats every three years, and it takes you pretty much through the, the most, most of the Bible. It does miss a few bits, which is a shame, but for the most part, it takes you through all of the Bible over three years, which is great. And sometimes in some of those readings we encounter, we come across stuff that is hard. Sometimes things that actually people outside the church might think is old-fashioned or outdated or just plain wrong. But it's in those moments, because the promise that I've made, I still have a duty to proclaim those things, don't I? I'm not to pick and choose what to preach on. I only to focus on the nice stuff and leave out the hard sayings too. You see, from time to time for each one of us, if our hearts are open to what God is teaching us in the Bible, then we will come across things that make us feel uncomfortable. That's definitely true for me, and I'm sure it's true for you as well. But you see, God loves us too much just to comfort us with nice stories. He wants to make us into the best that we can be. He wants to make us to be like Jesus. And he does that as we honestly engage with him through his word. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, God's word is described as being like a double-edged sword, able to cut through any defences and pretences we might put in the way so that he can have access to our hearts. God's word is able to afflict the comfortable to unsettle those who are overly reliant, but at the same time it's able to comfort the afflicted, those who have experienced injustice and abuse and bad treatment. It's like a balm to their wounds, it heals the soul. It helps us when we are low, and it humbles us when we are proud. It shows us the God who loves us and sent his son for us. And because of this reason, that means that we are a people of the word. The Bible is the word of God from his heart to his children. So let me encourage you then, this Bible Sunday, to think again about how we read this. If someone you cared for wrote a love letter after love letter to you, expressing their deepest feelings and sentiments to you, 
Wouldn't it be a terrible thing just to cast one of those, to cast them to the side, to leave them unread, or even just to skim read through it? Well, just like a love letter, God's word is to be read and cherished by his children. There's all sorts of practical ways we can do that. Sometimes people like to do a, a Bible in one year. You can even find an app for that for your phone. Or sometimes Bible reading notes. If you go to Books Alive down here in Hove or online, I'm sure you can find some. Whatever you decide to do, whatever works for you, whatever is realistic and is achievable, do it. But when you do it, let's remember that the almighty loving God of the universe wants to speak to us through it. That's why Sunday is an exciting day. Because not only do we get to hear from our Heavenly Father on our own, we do it as a family. That's why it's important to gather. We gather together to hear God speak to us week by week, showing us what he is like and pointing us to Jesus. Showing us how we can be saved, how we can know him through Jesus Christ, the living word. Amen. We now say the creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the Bible as your written word the record of your revelation to the world for all generations. Guide us in our reading of it, that we may not only know its teaching, but also understand its meaning. And may its message both be written in our hearts and be manifest in our lives for the glory of him who is the living word, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our prayers for the Anglican Communion, we pray for the Church in Wales, the Most Reverend John Davies, Archbishop of Wales and Bishop of Swansea and Brecon, and in our diocese for the Church Buildings Team, the Diocesan Advisory Committee and Mission and Pastoral Committee. In our parish, We pray especially for those who live in Goldstone Crescent and Goldstone Close, and for Jonathan Cook and David Keeling, our church wardens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, ruler of the kingdoms, we pray for the nations of the world, Have mercy on our broken and divided world. Forgive the selfishness, greed and arrogance that cause us to be at enmity with one another. Help all nations to live together in charity and goodwill and learn of the things that belong to peace. We pray particularly for our own country, as with many others, it is struggling to combat the impact of COVID-19 on the life of the nation and the world. Give wisdom to all involved in the decision-making process to fight the disease and preserve the life of our nation and other nations. We ask too for wisdom and insight to those researching for a vaccine and for the plans for its distribution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have made us members of Christ and his church in this parish. May we as a congregation reach upwards to your throne in worship and adoration 
inwards to one another in understanding and fellowship, and outwards to the world in evangelism and social compassion. On this Bible Sunday, we ask your blessing on our Bible study group, that it may deepen our understanding of your word and its message to us as individuals and its impact on our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the sick and those in any kind of need and for those who care for them. Daniel, Zoe and family, Doreen Elliott, Robert Delacour, David Peters, Shirley Peters, Arthur Green, Nancy Holmes, Margaret Shepherd, David Evans, Michael and Betty, and those in need of continual prayer, Anne O'Neill, Linda Wallace, Peter Chapman, Margaret Dolly, Jan and Roger, Alex, Chris, Marion Langton, L. C., Jack, Jackie Wood, Will Newman, Walter Beck. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the repose of the souls of the recently departed and for those who mourn them. Georgina Watts, Eileen White, and on the anniversaries of their deaths, we remember John Duncan, Rex Bull, Judy Whelan, Gordon MacDonald, Blanche Peel, Jack Langston, and Ronald Hotchkiss. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Collect or the Church's special prayer for this Bible Sunday. Blessed Lord, who caused all Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your Holy Word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And one of the prayers that the Bible has given us is the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray that now, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining us for our service on this Bible Sunday. Just to let you know about our services over the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday is the 1st of November, and it's what the church calls All Saints Day. That might be a, a particularly poignant uh, day for you if you've lost a loved one. Uh, if someone that you care about has died, particularly in the last year. It's, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, to join together, to, to ask for God's help and, and strength in that time. So we'll be having that service uh, both online and here at our 10 a.m. Parish Eucharist. Uh, and because it's the first Sunday of the month, four o'clock next Sunday is our St. Peter's at Four, which we, we launched last month with our harvest celebration. It was great to see so many people here in church. And this uh, coming Sunday, so the 1st of November, is our next St. Peter's at Four. And because it's the day after Halloween, we're having a bit of a light party. Now, some Christians choose to celebrate Halloween, some don't. But we wanted to be able to put on something that maybe isn't so much about sort of darkness and, and scary things, but it's actually about celebrating the light and Jesus, the light of the world. So that's next Sunday. And then the Sunday after that is our Remembrance Sunday as well. Again, another important time in the church's calendar to remember all of those who have died or been injured in war and in conflict. So I hope you can join us for one of those services over the next few weeks. All the details of that are on our website 
and uh, you can get in contact with the church as well by following the, the details on one of the notice boards outside the church. But now uh, that's enough from me. Let's just finish with our final blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.